if you'd asked me what is my profession, I'd have said writer. And that covers so much. Whether people, that's... The public, if those who know me would say, no, no, your profession is eating cake for a living. Restaurateur, businesswoman, novelist, bake-off judge, purveyor of colourful glasses and jackets, and now star of a one-woman show, Prue Leith. Welcome to Times Radio. Hi, <laughs> Matt. Uh, Prue, have you recovered from our transatlantic crossing? You know, it was wonderful, wasn't it? I, it was I, a lot I, of fun. I really enjoyed it. And it was a lot of fun, and uh, we had a lot of good talks. But it was I always had found it really restful, because, you know, I didn't have to think very much. <laughs> it's just being sort of lulled to sleep by the. Uh, so we should explain it was the 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 Times uh, uh, Sunday Times Cheltenham Literature Festival at sea, and we were both on there for a week, <laughs> crossing from New York to um to Southampton. Uh, and it was nice. It was nice to just sort of mix in with people, and I, I felt slightly shamed into having a salad one day when uh, you and I were chatting, and then we went and got lunch, and I really wanted a big pie. But um, I thought if I was having lunch with Pooleith, I probably couldn't do that. Well, I tell you what, that ship. You can eat eight meals a day if you like. So you could put on a couple of pounds just crossing the Atlantic. <laughs> there were definitely shirts that fitted at the start of the week that didn't at the end. So, Pooh, I, ra I rattled off all of your many... In fact, probably there's even more jobs than that. If, if I asked Ed Balls the same question, but I interviewed him uh, on the on the crossing. If you're filling in a form and it says name Prue Leith, occupation, what do you put? Well, do you know I now put retired, which is not true, but it, it, stop, it stops all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boring, boring. She's retired. Um, but yes, no, I know I do do it, a lot of things. Um, but um, if you'd asked me what is my profession, I'd have said writer. And that covers so much. If, if people, that's... It, the public, if those who know me would say, no, no, your profession is eating cake for a living. <laughs> And you're a writer, both of both of uh, cookbooks and uh, and so, on, but also uh, fiction and and your your autobiography. Yes, autobiography and also journal, a lot of journalism. I do mm. journalism all the time. It, it, journalism is great because it 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 feeds that writing bug. You know, it stops you feeling anxious because you're not writing something. On the other hand, it, it's not so um, stressful as writing a novel. <laughs> but I've written eight of those, and I've got stuck on the ninth, so I'm halfway through one. You're stuck, what? Because you can't, you don't know how it ends. No, no, I just find I didn't want to do it, and I keep finding, you know, displacement activity. I'll do anything except write the novel. Anyway, what my newest game is, which is a fine thing for an old lady like me to do, is I'm taking, I'm, I'm going on tour like a stand-up comic, like you. Yes. Actually, Matt, I finally understood why so many stand-up comics and this certainly doesn't apply to you yet but you ha you sometimes see actors or comics who just really should have retired years ago but they're still on that stage because they want that buzz that amazing feeling of the whole audience loving you and, and, and i know you actually starts next year at all but if you've done you've done some already some sort of I practice runs. Of, yeah i did a few tryouts first of all in bath and leamington spa and I was so frightened, I didn't enjoy it at all. My heart was banging like anything, and I was really scared. And the, the audience liked it, and they ticked all the boxes. You know, when you do a tryout, it's rather terrifying. The, the audience all get a little card to say, would you recommend this to a friend? And I thought, oh, God, I'll get about 40% or something dreadful. And I got 100%. Wow. 100% of the audience said they wanted, they would recommend it to a friend. So then I thought, well, I have to commit to this, but I still wasn't enjoying it. But when I got to Los Angeles, because I then went to New York and then to Los Angeles, because I went to do American tour as well. So I had to have a tryout for their producers. And, you know, I know the Americans are over the top anyway. <laughs> but Matt, I absolutely understood that desire for that buzz. Because before I, had, first of all, I asked Joanna Lumley if, um, if she thought I could do this, because I'm not an actress. I mean, she does it all the time and, and she loves it. And she said, go for it. She said, the audience have, uh, will only be there because they love you anyway. They've only bought a ticket because they're on your side. So they want you to, to do well. And, and they're just, so, so she said, you'll be fine. The audience will carry you. And then I understood that because these this um, Los Angeles audience, I walked onto the stage and they were shrieking and hollering and shouting 
we love you, Prue. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> and sort of some of them were standing up. I thought, my God, I'm going to get a standing ovation before I've opened my mouth. <laughs> and this is partly because Bake Off, Bake Off became a big hit in America during lockdown. Is that it's right? entirely because of Bake Off. I would love to say it was because I'm the greatest performer on stage ever seen. <laughs> Oh, it's because they love Bake Off. I mean, 99%, I've just launched today, I've just been um, looking at the samples. I've launched a, a China range, you know, with wonderful, lovely colours, bone china. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I've been trying to do this for years and years, but nobody would listen to me. But now, because I'm the Bake Off queen, <laughs> suddenly <laughs> all sorts of worlds have opened up for me. And um, so now things I've wanted to do for years, I'm now doing but I have um, to say, I didn't want to do the one woman tour for years. It never occurred to me. It only occurred to me when I met the producer, who is the guy who does Joanna Lumley's tours and her and all her yeah. television programs. He's her producer, Clive Tuller, he's called. And he, over lunch, probably having had a drink or two too many, um, he said, you know, I was telling funny stories or something, and he said, you should have a show. Why don't we do that? So I and said, why not? And now it's all happening. And now it's why all happening. Now, Pooh, I've got so much more to ask you about. Yeah, um, go on, go on. Let's talk about politics. You got your why tamehood not? last year. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, which I know <laughs> you joked that you 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 didn't because I asked you when we uh, we were talking on the cruise who 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 gave you your damehood, and you didn't get one of the big royals. Uh, no, I am um, my local lord lieutenant did it. And she was a very nice woman, but she had to do it because um, I had this wonderful letter from the palace, which it didn't, I can't remember the exact words, and it wouldn't have been quite as bold as this, but basically what it said is, look, we've got so many knights and dames queuing up to be dubbed <laughs> that we won't get round to you for, for four years. So um, you can, you've got every right to be done by a royal, but you'll have to wait. Um, or you can... Um, or you can have it done by your local lieutenant, Lord Lieutenant, who stands in for the Queen. Or they said, you can have it by post. <laughs> and I thought having, having it by post would be a little bit, you know, sort of thing comes through the arm. So I didn't think that or much of that. So I opted for the for the Lord Lieutenant. And she came along and my daughter read the citation, which is very unusual apparently. And um we had a few drinks and it was great. Very <laughs> it was nice. What about going one better proof? What about the House of Lords? Would you go to the House of Lords? Would I go to the House of Lords? Yeah. I'd go like a shot, but I, they, I know they won't have me. Because I was once asked many, many years ago, um, I was asked by both the Tory party and the Labour party if I would take their whip. You know, would you take the Labour whip? And I said no. And then would you take the Tory whip? And I said, no, again. And so I thought, well, you know, if, if two grandees from both of these parties think I would be useful in the House of Lords, I would love to do that. Because I'm an interfering bossy woman. I like to get my ball into everything. <laughs> and um, so then I, the only way to do it, to be, so I realised what I wanted to be is a crossbencher. So I would be independent. And um, so I, I applied, but I never got in. They sent me a nice letter saying, you're just the sort of thing, material we'd like in the House of Lords, but we don't have space for you at the moment, So you're, but your application is in a drawer. And there it stayed until I turned 70. And then when I turned 70, I had a letter from them saying, you can throw that, um, you know, forget it now, because <laughs> you're over 70 and we don't, we don't make... And you can't apply as a cost bench when you're over 70. Surely, yeah. surely. I mean, I can't believe that somebody's not made you sort of Minister for School Food. Minister for school dinners in the House of Lords. Well, um, and uh, no, they, they, they won't they won't have me anywhere near the House of Lords, obviously. But um, but I have spent a long time. I was chair of the School Food Trust, which was a government quango, and we did really really well. Um, I'm sorry to say, until the Tories came in and had their bonfire of the quangos, and we lost all our funding and seventy people who were working really hard and doing a lot of good work making um, school dinners better. But that's what happens with governments. It's really distressing how often good initiatives, um, which are backed by some minister, and then he leaves or is fired or moved. And, um, and then, you know, his successor isn't interested in his, that guy's passions. He wants his own, of 
she wants her own. And so they take the money away and do something else with it. And do you think that, the, literally on that specific issue, the quality of school dinners has got worse as a result? It's certainly got worse, but it's got worse for a whole lot of reasons. The main one is that food is not considered education by the Department of Education. If they did what they do in Finland, which makes puts a, a knowledge of food and an understanding of healthy food, and actually they even have and a like of good food, because frankly, if you don't, if children don't like food, it's no good preaching at them that it's healthy and it's good for them. They have to learn to like it, to love it. And if they if they learn cooking and they learn about sustainability and they go to out to farms and they see how cheese is made and all the rest, they get to like food, and then. You know, there's some hope that they'll grow up eating healthy food. And I went to, to a university in Finland because I sort of didn't believe them. I thought this is all so perfect, as it's all compulsory. Every child has to learn to cook. Every child has to eat the school dinner. There's no choice. It's um, Food is in every single um, lesson in one way or another, whether it's sports or nutrition in science and so on. And so I thought, well, that's easy. But when they leave school, which they do at 16 to go to, college at 17 they went they'll go straight into mcdonald's weren't they and so i went to i went into see one of these enormous universities or colleges and they, there they did have all around the edge of the room they had dunking donuts and all the things that you know um are not particularly good for you and then in the middle they had all this food that the children had learned to like at school so there were salads and there were, you know, um, there were pizzas and there were pies and there were, there were all sorts of good, healthy food. And all the children, almost all the children were in the middle eating what they were used to. I mean, yes, they'll have an odd cupcake or Dunkin' Donut or something, but not often. And on the subject, of, so next month we were supposed to be having the junk food ban, the yeah, ban on buy one, get one free offers and pre-watershed adverts and all that sort of thing. That's now been kicked into the long grass again, I think, till after the next election. So who knows what's going to happen then? Yeah, I know. Well, it, um, governments are always torn, aren't they? Because they get, a, you know, it profits them if, he, if, if manufacturers sell a lot of chocolate and ice cream because they get a lot of tax. So they're always a little conflicted. But I think if they started with education, I did say all this to Michael Gove when he was Minister of Education, <laughs> but he didn't... Uh, he absolutely got the point. He's a very bright guy. And actually, the report that he got Henry Dimbleby to write on about, food policy, yeah. about food policy was absolutely brilliant. I mean, if any government would just pick that up and do it, we'd have no obesity problem. We'd have a lot of, you know, good trade and, yeah. So, so why do you think they don't do it? Because you've, like you said, you've worked, it's not like you're just... So, you know, uh, somebody who's come to this, like you were literally worked in the Department of Education, you ran the, the School yeah. Food Trust. Why yeah. don't they do it? Um, because it would be it would be highly controversial. I mean, people who have brought up their children on, um, on takeaways don't take kindly to having what they think of as a nanny state telling them that they've got to eat that. But actually where it's, on the few schools that have done it, and I have even known a few British schools have done it very thoroughly, the parents end up absolutely delighted because they don't have the kids nagging them in the <laughs> supermarket. You know, I want that for my school lunch and I want that. Because they, there's no choice. You go and eat what you're given and you eat really nice, delicious food. Again, Henry Dimbleby is practicing what he preaches. He has a charity called Chefs in Schools. And the chefs are trained to not only cook, obviously they know how to cook, but they cook very healthy food, a lot of it vegetarian. They talk, sit down with the children and they eat with them and they are responsible for talking to them and training them and teaching them about food. And it really works. And the kids love it. And they eat it. Uh, one other thing I want to ask you about politics. I, I, listeners might know this, but your son is a Conservative MP, Danny Kruger. Yes, yeah. um, and you, you two, it's fair to say you don't agree much on politics. And the, the current uh, thing is the uh, uh, the issue of assisted dying. Yeah. Um, uh, you're pro and he's anti. Yes, yes, he is. Um, he, he's, a very, he's a very principled fellow and I do understand his objections. And as a politician, he feels that it's a dangerous way to go a bit to um, allow assisted dying because he thinks that it's a slippery slope and that 
you know, we start off saying maybe, you know, we, we might start off saying um, that um, only people who have got six months to die, you know, until their death, they are already diagnosed as dying um, and they're in incurable pain and, um, and so on, should be allowed to do it. And that's what I campaign for. You're looking forward to Christmas finally? Do you have a big Christmas, small Christmas turkey, all the trimmings? <laughs> You well, must I'm, be sick I'm, actually of going, I'm actually going to Sun Daniels for Christmas. Ah, oh, there we are, you see. But no politics around the Christmas table. And no politics around the Christmas table, but I'm cooking the dinner, but he's doing all the, you know, the the, the, the thing that, that is exhausting about family Christmas is, is that making all the extra beds and worrying about the other meals, you know, Christmas <laughs> Eve and what you're going to have on Chris, Boxing Day and so on. And he's got to do all that. So he's I, doing all of that. Christmas and if people are looking for a Christmas present, how can they get tickets to your, your one-woman show? They just have to, oh, my God, I should be able to tell you what they have to is do. Is it just mickperrin.com? Is that the yes, website? It's Mick, Mick Perrin's, yes. Yeah. And um, they can buy tickets online and they should certainly do that for Christmas presents. Last minute Christmas presents. My show.